This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by So and Mo. Launched this year, So and Mo is a new lawn care brand bringing the right products and expertise to give everyone the confidence to be a lawn expert. They've developed the perfect 12 month plan through six liquid feeds to give your lawn all the nutrients needed for complete plant health and professional results. Packaged into a one size fits all box, lasting six, 12 or 24 months based on the lawn size, this ensures the ability to cater for all lawns with no waste. As a special offer for listeners, So and Mo is offering 15% off your first box. Simply visit soandmo.com and enter the code ROOTS15, all uppercase, at the checkout. In today's episode, I'm joined by Greg Peterson, who started the Urban Farm nearly 30 years ago. His third of an acre site is covered in edible crops, which feed his family and other families too. Gardening as he does in Phoenix, Arizona, he has to make full use of rainwater harvesting systems, soil improvement techniques, plus he's heavy into recycling and reuse. We talk about how he's created a fully functioning and successful farm in an urban neighbourhood. Greg begins by talking about what prompted him to start the urban farm. Well, I, in the eighth grade, so rewind back to 1974, I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the ocean. So I knew back then that there was an issue with how we were living on the planet and our food systems. And over the years, I discovered uh, regenerative design inside of permaculture and spent a lot of time in the 90s and 2000s looking at how our food system was dysfunctional. And I came to the conclusion about 15 years ago that urban agriculture, growing food right where we eat it, is, and I, I tell people it's the capital T, the solution to our global food system problems is growing food in the city. So uh, I embarked on a journey in 2001 to turn the turn my home. I've lived here for 32 years and turn my home and the property here into what I call an environmental showcase home. The property itself is 80 feet wide and 160 feet deep, and I have basically turned it into an edible landscape. Wow, that is impressive. And do you think that's, is is that a usual amount of space for a residential property, and is that enough? Um, Well, it's enough for me and a couple of families, and it's quite unusual to see this. And I, I embarked on a project about 15 years ago to create Uh, 10,000 urban farms in Phoenix. And really that's to encourage others to create their yards into an urban farm. So it's really what I do. Uh, I tell people all the time that the, the dirt here at the urban farm is my hobby. And my job is to enroll people and teach them how to create their landscapes so that they can eat them. Because it makes no sense to me to plant something that you can't eat or, you know, or plant something that doesn't support an edible landscape. Mm. So no room for ornamentals? You know, is it, is it completely food produce? Great question. And ornamentals are, have many uses in my landscape. I stay away from a couple of the ornamentals that are that are fairly useless uh, and and or have thorns. So I stay. I generally stay away from thorns and wood that can't be broken down. But ornamentals are great in because they make flowers, and flowers bring in pollinators, and pollinators pollinate and make more food. So uh, I said a minute ago. I said. I plant everything so that it's edible or it supports edible. And there's my big ash tree out in my backyard. It's 60 feet tall and, uh, you know, it provides shade for me. So it shades the house. Plus, twice a year, it dumps leaves that I use in my mulch 
uh, in my mulching composting system. So just because you can't eat something doesn't mean you don't put it in the space. But if I put something in the space, it has multiple uses. We call in permaculture, we call that stacking functions. Interesting. Yeah. And and one of the things I think about permaculture is I think people tend to think, you know, that the entire site has to be productive. It has to have a use. And sometimes I personally forget that humans are part of the system. So do you also have (laughs) spaces for humans where, where we can relax and, you know, enjoy the garden? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I have this beautiful, it is west facing and in the desert that's pretty hot, but I have this beautiful west facing outdoor patio and kitchen that's about 800 square feet. And, you know, we have uh, fires out there and eat dinner out there. Uh, Our front porch is nicely landscaped with potted edibles and flowers. So we actually, on the front porch, we grow lettuces and greens and those kinds of things in pots along with the flowers. So how much of your food do you buy and how much do you grow yourself, would you say, as a percentage? Very good question. Um, we eat out of the yard every day. And so we're we're constantly harvest something, harvesting something. I would say... Uh, on a year-over-year basis, we probably get 30% of our food out of the yard. Some months, like July and August, we're not getting much of anything. Uh, other months, like January, February, March, and April, we're getting lots. So you do have a down season, and that would be kind of mid-summer for us? Anyway. Mid, uh, uh, I'd call it late summer, when it's just too hot for really anything to be outside. Obviously, you're gardening in a desert. How do you manage water in that environment? Oh, that's a that's a challenge, especially in a um, especially in a desert where we're in a massive drought. And one of my favorite things to use is something called drip tape. Drip tape is a uh, a drip irrigation system, but the the key piece to it is, is that the drip tape evenly distributes water through the entire system. So if you're setting up a drip irrigation, it's tr- a traditional drip irrigation system, you're going to get more water at the beginning of the system than at the end of the system. With drip tape, and this is something that farmers use, with drip tape, you get and even watering from the beginning to the end. And it, so you get everything watered um, the same way. So that's one way uh, is drip tape. Another way is we heavily rely on rainwater harvesting and gray water harvesting. Rainwater harvesting is harvesting the water that falls on our property uh, in, in the form of rainfall. And what I've done here in 32 years is I've designed rainwater harvesting systems to direct the water when it comes to the places in the yard that are basins that catch that water. And then we grow mostly native and fruit trees around those basins. So what we're doing with the Rainwater is we're directing it into the landscape and then planting around the basins where we direct it to. And then gray water is any water that goes down any sink of your house or any drain of your house except your kitchen sink and your toilet. And in Arizona, it is legal to use gray water in our landscape. We just have to figure out how to get it to it. So one of the things that I've done here at the Urban Farm is I actually moved some facilities outside. So I have a nice kitchen sink outside where we rinse vegetables and rinse our hands and that water goes into the landscape. Plus I have an outdoor shower that when we uh, when we take a shower that water goes out into the landscape. So that's two of the ways that we manage water here. We use a a super efficient drip irrigation system called drip tape. We use rainwater and gray water harvesting. There's a third way that we count on for water here at the urban farm, and that's water from our air conditioning 
and evaporative cooler systems. And so we collect that water. If, for anybody that has an air conditioning system, there's usually a place off of the roof where there's this drip, drip, drip when the air conditioning is running. We collect that water and use it in our landscape. And do, when you use the shower and you direct that water away, do you have to be careful about the kind of products that you use, say detergents or shampoos or anything else? Absolutely. You have to be careful with what you put down the drain because, you know, strong things like bleach and heavy chemicals going down the drain, they're not going away any longer. They're going into your landscape. So you have to be super conscious about what you're using. Uh, and there's um, harvesting. I'll come up with the URL for you uh, for a rainwater harvesting website by uh, Brad Lancaster. And he's got a list of soaps that you could you should be using in an, in outdoor situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really useful. Um, so I think everybody's probably got a preconceived idea of what a desert soil would look like. But what does your soil actually look like? And, and how do you fertilize it? Ah, oh, that's a great question. And we actually don't have desert soil. We have desert dirt. And our dirt here in the low desert is basically has zero organic matter in it. Uh, most tests, if you test desert dirt, it's going to have less than a half a percent of organic matter. Now, I am a huge proponent of teaching people how to build healthy soil. Healthy soil, I believe, is the single most important thing that you can do in growing healthy food is grow healthy soil. There are five components of healthy soil. Dirt is one of them. Dirt has micronutrients in it that, uh, because it's broken down rock, that if the soil that you build isn't healthy, the plants can't uptake those nutrients. So if you're just trying to plant in desert dirt, good luck with that. So the five components of healthy soil, dirt, airspace, water, organic matter, and everything that's alive in the soil. So how we fix the dirt here in the desert is we add lots and lots and lots of organic matter. And so in a garden, we will be adding compost and planting mix. Um, planting mix usually has compost in it. And then planting from there. I had a, a situation a few years ago where one of my friends wanted a garden. So we built it at her house. And it was in a garden bed that was four foot wide by eight feet long and it was dirt so what i did is i got this really nice planting mix and i put six inches of planting mix right on top of the dirt and then we planted and i you know i bid her adieu and went my own way and about an hour we had her garden planted and what i want you to take note of what i just said is i didn't dig we just put the planting mix six inches of planting mix right on top and then we plant it and we let the roots do the rest of the work. So what I do in garden beds like that is, and really everywhere you garden, you should be adding an inch or two of compost every year to your garden beds. So what we do every year with her garden bed is we just add an inch or two of compost on top. That's what I do with my garden beds here. And then with trees, uh, trees and bushes, what we do is we put a basin around the plant. And I usually say at least a six foot diameter basin with six inches of woody mulch in it. So woody mulch is wood chips and you never want to put wood chips in a garden. Wood chips steal the nitrogen away from the soil. What we're doing in the basins around the tree is we're adding six inches of woody mulch and what happens over time, over the course of a year to 18 months, is that breaks down into this really nice, healthy soil. Because at the interface between the dirt and the woody mulch, it starts making healthy soil fairly quickly. The second thing that woody mulch does, and the more woody mulch, the better, and this is really anywhere, is that it acts like a sponge and it holds on to that water. So, especially in the desert and dry climates, having that woody mulch layer to hold the water in helps us with our watering. 
I suppose the typical permaculture garden would be a closed loop system. So you would take nothing out and you would bring nothing in. But I'm guessing when you have soil like you do, can you produce enough organic matter of your own or do you actually need to import some at least to start with? Yeah, that's a gr- that's a great question. Um, we have to bring it in, especially when you're starting. Uh, I even bring it in now. I have an agreement with a local restaurant, and I get ten buckets of of uh, food waste a week from them. And so I make my own compact post. And until I started three years ago, bringing in ten buckets of food waste from a restaurant. Uh, I didn't have enough compost on site. So um, <clears throat> for what we're doing here, it does take uh, a fair amount of organic matter that you have to bring in. And you mentioned permaculture and, and the system being a closed loop system. I personally don't believe in the human condition we can actually build 100% closed loop systems. In the human in the human part of it, nature can. And if we were just in the desert, if we were just relying on natural systems here, we could grow some things. They would all be desert edibles. But if we're going to grow, you know, vegetables and, and uh, fruit trees and that kind of stuff, we have to bring in organic matter. The good news is here in the country we have this uh, website called ChipDrop.com. And actually, I think they're expanding globally. And what they do is they coordinate with you and a tree trimming service to dump woody mulch in your driveway. And that works really well because that, that, that can easily net you 20 or 30 cubic yards of woody mulch that you can then build in the soil. Mm, that's amazing. I hope they do roll that out because I would love that. Um, so uh, obviously you have fairly challenging growing conditions. So are you seed saving? Are you are you selecting plants that show some resilience in your conditions and then saving the seed and planting those in future years? Uh, yes-ish. So what I do here at the Urban Farm, first of all, we treat, teach a lot about seed saving in all of our online education. And what I do here at the Urban Farm is I plant open pollinated seeds. Open pollinated land race or heirloom seeds are the the older varieties that when you plant them, you get the same thing. And the difference there is the, um, in hybrids, uh, hybrid is watermelon A and watermelon B, and they cross pollinate them, and they get watermelon C. And it's not genetically uh, as stable as an heirloom. So what I do here at the urban farm is I only plant heirloom or open pollinated seeds, and then I let them go to seed. So what I've done here at the urban farm is I've truly created a food forest by which things reseed themselves every year. And at any given moment during the year, I have carrots and parsley and basil and oregano and nasturtiums and fennel and um, lettuce and kale and cabbage, all of these things, oh, and garlic and onions, all of these things reseed or replant themselves every year in my landscape so that all there is for me to do is to go out into the landscape, harvest the food, and and bring it in and eat. So, I mean, you're building up, I suppose, your own seed bank there, aren't you? Uh, exactly. And then some of them, you know, I do have a small collection, uh, you know, a couple of buckets of uh, individually saved seeds from my parsley and different th- lettuce and that kind of stuff that I actually save. But mostly I let the landscape handle the seeding. Mm, yeah, I like that. It's very low maintenance. Um, how much of a revolutionary are you in Phoenix? <laughs> well, I've been doing this for uh, 32 years. Uh, I am quite known here in Phoenix and, and with my podcast, Urban Farm Podcast, I'm fairly known globally in sharing people's stories about how they got started and their successes and failures. And um, yeah, I've been doing 
quite vocally here in Phoenix. I've been doing this for 25 years. Yeah. And, and what made you start your podcast? I mean, what is your gardening mission? In 1991, there were multiple things that happened for me. I was 30 years old and there were multiple things that happened for me in my life that year. One of them was I read a book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And just go read it. It's an amazing book. The gorilla is the teacher. And he talks about Quinn in his book talks about how we got as a culture to where we're at and the pitfalls that we're running into. The second thing that happened for me is I did a, uh, did my first permaculture design course. The third thing that happened for me was a uh, friend of mine was sailing in the South Pacific. And when he came back, he, um, communicated this story with me. They, they anchored in an Island. They were looking for a grocery store and somebody said, uh, go pick your own. It's just growing out there. For me, that was a, a major light bulb that went on. It was like, Whoa, hold on. And then the fourth thing, which really propelled me forward in 1991 was, uh, I did a, a course at landmark edu education and create out of it i created myself to be the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system i believe that our global food system is broken at best at best and uh, that it it needs a lot of work and what i'm clear about is i can't do it all myself so given that my job each day is to transform our global food system i had to find ways to communicate that out to the world. And my podcast is one of them, the Urban Farm Podcast. We, we're getting about 50,000 listens a month right now. And people are really engaged. They're, um, yeah, the, I get a lot of feedback from people on the stories that we tell on the Urban Farm Podcast. And so really that's the reason, to help get the word out and here's the other piece of that. This mission of mine, transforming our global food system, it's not mine. It's ours. And, you know, people like you and uh, other people doing work, it, we can't claim it as our own. This is, this is a global challenge that we have that takes more than just me. And what I do with my podcast is I inspire people to go out and plant gardens. Really, that's what it's about you know, transform your landscape at your house into something you can eat. Why not? Indeed. So it's a global issue, but do you see a future where we are all growing local? That is my intent. That is what I see. Again, as I said earlier, I, I believe that the place to fix this problem is in the cities where we, you know, where we live. And, you know, when you look at Havana, Cuba, they, they grow a lot, still, they grow a lot of their own food. So why not? It just, it takes tweaking people's thought process, getting them to think about, all right, well, I could grow basil in a pot on my back patio. I could grow a little bit of lettuce. What if I grew a whole salad? Oh, by the way, I have dirt here in the backyard. What if I put in a chicken coop and got eggs you know, but like that? So it's a it's a transformational process that we're in. Mm. Yeah. And so I know in the States, well, I think in the States, you have slightly more robust uh, rules and regulations when it comes to, for instance, what you can grow in your front yard. So I wondered, mm -hmm. is everyone in your neighborhood on board and are there rules and regulations that you need to be mindful of when you're creating your urban farm? Um. Yes, I have neighbors on board. In fact, one of my newly added neighbors in the past year and a half, he's converting his entire his entire landscape like mine. And I don't I don't know if he knew I was here when he arrived, but he's excited to play. And I, one of the things that I do to make a living is I educate people about fruit trees here in the desert and how to successfully grow them in the desert, and then they can buy fruit trees from me. And I've been doing this for 22 years, and there are 22 houses on my street and over the years I've given all of them at least one or two or 10 fruit trees 
So uh, my deal with our street is that if you live on the street, you can get a free fruit tree from me. So I, you know, that's one of the ways I inspire uh, people to do it. I, one of my across the street neighbors came to me a few years ago and she communicated this with me. She said, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day and she was telling me all about this cool place here in Phoenix called the urban farm. And my neighbor lit up and she said, she told her, yeah, that's my neighbor. So mostly my neighbors are on board. I mean, what's not to be on board about? I grow lots of food. Definitely. Yeah. So, so do you, but do you have to be careful about the kind of look of it or do you have a, a, a quite a, a lot of freedom with that? Great. So from an aesthetics perspective, what I have always been really on top of is making sure that it looks nice. And uh, I went back to school in 1999 and I got two degrees, two uh, university degrees, uh, a bachelor's and a master's. Both of them are in urban and environmental planning. So from a urban planning perspective, what, what I know is that I want to make sure that what I put in place is cool and looks good for the neighborhood so that they're more on board. So what I've done over the course of the last 20 years is I've made sure that what I have in place is aesthetically pleasing so that people like it. And I fortunately don't live in a neighborhood with an HOA or a uh, homeowners association. Uh, and so there are no state or city regulations that prevent me from growing food in the front yard. Now, homeowners associations are a different story here in uh, the United States. They have a big say on what you can and can't grow, and that's a totally different story. But I don't have any problem with that. Plus, everything that I do in my front yard, I make sure that it's aesthetically pleasing. So it's possible to be aesthetically pleasing and productive. That's really good to know, actually, because I think a lot of people uh, are under the misapprehension that, that productive spaces don't always look good, but that's that's really useful to know. Um, yeah. So thinking about people who might be dipping a toe in the water of an urban farm, I wondered if you could just maybe give one easy win that people could achieve if they're thinking of starting. Well, the most expensive thing to buy in the grocery store and the easiest thing to grow are herbs. You can grow herbs on a sunny windowsill, basil, oregano, cilantro. You can grow herbs in a pot on a patio. So that's an easy win right out of the, you know, right out of the chute. Um, you know, and then taking it farther. If you look at your garden beds, if you have any garden beds at all, and you look at them, making... I would say change out two or three plants that are edible as a start. You know, if you just have a, a garden bed full of flowers, add some lettuce or add something you like. And then the other piece of this is you always want to grow what you love. I, uh, I get this question a lot from people, hey, you know, what kind of fruit trees should I grow in my yard? And what I say is, what kind of fruit do you like? Because if you're growing something and you don't like it, don't do it. Yeah, absolutely. You have to you have to grow something that you like. And also, I like the fact that you suggest kind of it is an easy win. And it, and it's something if you pick a herb or, or a salad crop, then it's something you can use regularly. And you keep you get into the kind of mindset of keep popping out to the backyard, harvesting and going in and using it. So I think that's a really good tip. Um, So I think that is pretty much it for my questions. Did we miss anything that you wanted to speak about? Here's what I tell people. Anybody can do this. You don't have a black thumb. You don't have a brown thumb. Anybody can grow something if they know what the rules are. And the good news is inside of permaculture, they, we, they, permaculture teachers teach those rules. And those rules are specific to your area, but they're gen in general, they're the same kinds of rules. And they start with observe. Pay attention to what's going on in your space. And when you do something, if you fail at it, you're going to, you know, you're going to fail. I promise you, I've killed, I've killed more plants than most people have, not on purpose, but that's just what happens. So take that into consideration and, 
and then do something different next time. So start slow and spend your time observing. So there you have the lowdown to growing food in the middle of a desert in your back garden. And if you'd like to find out more about Greg's urban farm, I've put links in the show notes, along with links to Brad Lancaster's water harvesting page and Daniel Quinn's Ishmael. Thank you to Greg for taking part in the interview and to you, as always, for listening. Please also go and check out this episode's sponsors, So and Mo. They're offering 15% off your first order. Visit soandmo.com or follow the link in the show notes and enter the code ROOTS15, all uppercase, at the checkout. Here's Dr Ian Bedford now with a bug that attacks one of the nation's favourite flowers. As summer begins, one of our most emotive and iconic groups of plants takes centre stage in many gardens across the country. These are the flowering roses and, subgrouped as wild, old garden and modern garden varieties, they encompass almost every type of growing style. With such diversity of flower form, fragrance and colour, that there's always one variety that will make the perfect plant for occasion or purpose within a garden. But just as we love the roses, so do many different invertebrate species, many of whom have become specialists in colonising and feeding on them. And this includes rose aphids that suck out the sap, rose tortrix moths whose caterpillars nibble the leaves, and rose chafer beetles that eat the petals. But there's also some invertebrates that, in the process of living on a rose bush, cause problems other than just through their direct feeding damage. And probably the most common of these is the rose leaf rolling sawfly. Sawfly are insects that are in the same taxonomic group as bees, wasps, and ants. And the leaf rolling sawfly are about one eighth of an inch long, black in colour, with two pairs of transparent wings. And they're often seen flying around the new leaf growth on roses during spring and early summer, whilst they look for a mate. When ready to lay eggs, the female returns to the new growth areas and starts to insert her eggs into the tender new rose leaves. At the same time, she also injects a chemical that reacts with the leaf cells and over the following hours causes the leaf to curl protectively around the egg. After a week, the eggs hatch into small green larvae, each protected inside a curled leaf, where they start to eat their way through the layers of leaf material. And by midsummer, the larvae are fully grown, and the curled leaves will have become skeletonized. The larvae then crawl down to the soil to overwinter before they pupate in the spring and emerge from the ground as the next generation of adults a few weeks later. Being so well protected within the curl of a leaf, The sawfly larvae are not easily found and predated on by natural enemies. So if necessary, small infestations can be controlled by simply removing the affected leaves by hand and disposing of them accordingly. With more severe infestations, some of the leaves could also be removed, but in addition, the overwintering larvae could be exposed to frosts and insectivorous birds by digging around the base of the rose during winter. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All podcast.